All right, cool. It should be good now. Um, I'll send a link in the chat. I think we're good to start. I don't know. All right. Um, hey, everybody. That's Jake saying. I'll be giving the one four for the side proposition in today's debate. And if there's nobody that's not ready, I can just get started. If you're not ready, just give me an indication. Okay, seeing none, I'm just gonna get started. Panel, all the headlines you've ever seen about violence from extremist groups generally has one thing in common. They emphasize the negative aspects of the attacks, all the destruction they've caused and the evil intentions of the perpetrators. But that barely even shows a fraction of the whole picture. You don't see how the West invalidates the religion of Muslims. You don't see how Western intervention has perpetuated suffering and affected areas. And at the point at which you only see a tiny portion of the bigger picture, we're so proud to propose. In this speech, just expect two things. Firstly, some notes on framing before moving on to substitute material. Firstly then, on framing, we have two notes here. First, what does the demonization of Islamic terrorists actually look like? We think it looks like the criticism of Muslim people writ large, painting them and their actions as just inherently evil, demeaning the religious legitimacy, so on and so forth. But secondly though, What's the distinction between demonization as opposed to seeing them as criminals with legitimate grievances as the motion asks us to analyze? Two things here. Firstly, demonization ignores the main rationale for terrorists to pursue violence in the status quo. They're doing it to fend off against Western intervention into Islamic countries. Acknowledgement of terrorists as criminals with legitimate grievances is uniquely different from that of recognizing terrorists for why they hold certain beliefs and commit actions that are still deemed wrongful, rather than just saying that people are committing these acts simply because they're inherently evil. Secondly, though, it's also worth noting that recognizing recognition of these terrorists as criminals also implicitly means that these individuals are human beings who are deserving of things like rehabilitation and redress of their concerns like other criminals are. Now to our first substitute on the principle and the obligation of the press. But before I get into this, I can take a point if there is one. Would you, for instance, support the legitimization and glorification of Hitler supporters, for instance, who have committed genocide? Okay, we never said that we're legitimizing like Hitler. We never said that we're glorifying these terrorists in the first place. What we're saying is that these terrorists have legitimate justifications like against Western intervention. That's totally different from Hitler who literally just committed an entire genocide for basically no reason because he thought his race was morally superior. What we're telling you is that they have legitimate incentives against things like Western intervention. This is totally just not a comparative. Don't let them paint that analogy for us. Now then, onto the first substantive on the principle and the obligation of the press, the thesis of this argument is incredibly simple. The media has a moral duty to tell the truth and to represent global affairs in as accurate a manner as they can. Why is this duty violated by the opposition? Three mechanizations as to how this happened. First, note that most sources of globalized popular media are like fundamentally controlled by the white and wealthy West. News stories often take Eurocentric viewpoints that are racist, sexist, and discriminatory in nature. Their employees all tend to be majority white, male, European. White males dominate their administrations. Why is that a huge issue? It's because these media outlets are almost always the most influential for people across the world. What this, this does is it gives the landed elite the ability to control information, spin narratives about Muslims, and influence global perception on the nearly 2 billion practitioners of the religion. Secondly, though, we think that on the incentive level, they're always going to have the incentive to go to the extremes and paint a negative picture of Muslim extremists. Making them out as terrorists gets more clicks, views, and ad revenue than actually hearing their signs, seeing the positive aspects. Just think back for a second. When was the last time you actually heard something overwhelmingly positive on the news? We would tell you negative and inflammatory stories disproportionately get more coverage than feel good and positive ones. 
Secondly, though, it's unjust to paint the other side as a perpetual villain. This gives an us versus them mentality, and it's unfair, especially because their stories and justifications are not heard or listened to or asked for. The duty of the press is to tell everyone's stories is to inform instead of to villainize. What else the comedy does is to divide individuals and make them more fearful and hateful towards Muslim people as a whole. When the news depicts terrorism in the Middle East, 24 seven, you have no choice but to generalize all Muslims. So this is the only worldview that you're exposed to. But secondly, though, you also never truly consider why terrorists commit these actions in the first place and why they detest the West, which is generally the motivations for perpetrating attacks. Thirdly, though, even if you panel, think it's a true characterization we believe the media should never take hard opinionated stances on gray and morally dubious subject matters that's morally reprehensible, two reasons why that's uniquely bad. Firstly, you frame an issue and create news packages to influence the way a story is perceived when you intentionally include some pieces of information and deliberately exclude others that silences viewpoints and discourse that otherwise would have materialized. Secondly, though, the demonizing nature of Western media has held prejudices. It's reinforced hatred against Muslims, and we're going to get to that later in the second substitute. What are the impacts here? On a principal level, we believe that every group in the community deserves to have their voice heard because there are no vehicles where people can go to share their stories, their ideas, and their opinions. We believe it's morally dubious for the media to villainize them and group them up with vast, sweeping generalizations. Note that this principle functions on a higher plane a priori to any pragmatic considerations of this debate and panel, it acts as an independent ballot to proposition in, in this debate. Our second substantive though is on Islamophobia. The thesis of this argument is that no matter which way you slice it, demonizing Islamic terrorists is going to necessarily increase negative sentiment against Muslims across the Western world. That increases xenophobia and it makes it a more dangerous environment for Muslims at large. At the point at which you're promoting a mentality that they're taking these actions because they're inherently evil and have no legitimate justification in that vein, you're going to be increasing Islamophobia Four main mechanisms as to how this happened. Firstly, it leads to an us versus them mentality, as you've already told you. The difference between demonizing terrorists and actually portraying them as real grievances is that seeing them as just inherently evil people locks the public into an us versus them mentality. We are the good guys. They are the bad ones. They're committing all of these terrible actions just because they're bad people alone. If Muslims are painted as the wisdom, victims in, or vigilants in a story, that's necessarily going to increase the public's distrust, their hatred, and their xenophobia against them because of this mentality. Secondly, those kind of generalizations, we're not understanding the individual level justifications for these attacks and just portraying all Islamic terrorists as having negative, evil motivations that increases the probability that Muslims as a whole are going to be seen as bad people at the point at which you're failing to understand the actual motivations of these terrorist right. attacks. At that point, generalizations are going to be far more impactful and detrimental to the general Muslim public. Thirdly, though, it's because it inflames the public's emotions. Because generally, when you're demonizing these terrorists, we already gave you analysis as to how the media has an incentive to try and over-exaggerate the negative details about the attacks while talking about any possible justifications for why they're actually occurring. That emphasis inflames the emotions of viewers, and that puts the public in a state of anger. That's necessarily bad because anger supersedes all other emotions, and it makes it more likely the public will act irrationally in their negative sentiments against Muslims. Fourthly, though, we totally eliminate the possibility of compromise or understanding. We think that on side opposition, you're not mentioning anything about the justifications of these terrorists and why they're making their actions. That's going to eliminate any chance that the general populace in the Western world is going to be sympathetic to Muslims and decreases the mutual understanding, takes out any possibility of compromise. What are the impacts here? It's pretty simple. Three things. Firstly, you can increase negative sentiment against Muslims on your side of the house, increased bias that has immense psychological damage on the Muslim community in the Western world as a whole. Secondly, though, you also get an increase in the occurrence of hate crimes against Muslims on their side of the house because people see them as unwelcome. And they associate them with the extremism of these terrorists that they have absolutely no other association with. Thirdly, though, I think you also get increased conservatism on our side of the house. That's to say, the vast majority of Islamophobes are right-wingers who are far less tolerant than those on the left side of the aisle looked at after 9-11 when there was a huge surge in popular support for President George W. Bush that extends the impacts of this debate to elections, to the rights of minorities, to political attitudes in the Western world, all of the things that are in contention in the political realm. At that point, we're so proud to propose. Hi, I'm ready if everyone else is. Cool, I'll be keeping my camera off because I've been dropping in and out of Zoom. Um, POIs in the chat, please. Pronoun she, her. Time starts now. 
panel, we refuse to live in a world where the question of whether it is justified to kill thousands of innocent women and children who have done absolutely nothing to participate in any of the grievances you have suffered from becomes a debate. Because proposition breeds a society of apologists for the worst, most violent, fundamentally despicable people in the world, opening up the floodgate for an even more violent society we are so proud to oppose. In this speech, I'll be doing some framing, then I'll explain our first argument on why this narrative is untrue, our second argument on why it's harmful to victims of terrorism, and our third argument on increasing the cycle of violence. Refutations will be largely integrated. On the framing, first, Proposition sneakily tries to tell you in their model that we're demonizing the Muslim religion. No, we are demonizing people who commit acts of terror. We are demonizing people who literally bomb our families. Yes, people will always be bigots on either side of the house. We think that the vast majority of people are rational enough to know that just because a small group committed crimes, it does not re represent the entire Muslim population. Next, after Erica's POI, Proposition tells you that they're going to push this narrative in media in the counterfactual world where criminals who have legitimate grievances are still bad. That's why they claim, oh, we are not necessarily glorifying terrorism. This is quite a soft stance, but it also does not function in reality. We would say that regardless of intent, as long as this narrative exists that does not directly demonize terrorists, it's necessarily going to become a source of sympathy. This is analogous to the TV show Breaking Bad. The show undoubtedly recognizes that Walter White is a criminal, but even though he is a criminal, it's a technicality instead of a bad label. Instead, the show evokes a sense of sympathy, a sense of righteousness, and a sense that he needed to do what he did for the greater good and for his family. That's why thousands of these fans are sympathizing with Walter and constantly defending him against the people who point out that what he did was in the morally wrong, because now they've been given an outlet to empathize with him. We're going to show you why that's horrible in the context of real world terrorists. On the model, i.e. what happened in the status quo, we would say that we support media portraying them as irrevocably bad people who did bad things. We tell them that it's not something you should sympathize with, but an unfortunate thing that we need to change and fix. We demonize all acts of terror, including ones committed by Western people like the shooting in New Zealand. Moving on to our first substantive on why this narrative in itself is untrue. We would posit that people who are involved in terrorist organizations, aside from the people who are like the top dog, like Osama bin Laden, are typically in this terrorist group because they have been in indoctrinated, fed misinformation, or forced into the situation out of desperation to make a quick buck. What does this look like? It looks like fake historical narratives. Even if there were some past grievances, they were twisted and their stories were rewritten to suit the side of Islamic terrorists. It looks like propagandist map maps and posters. It looks like stories that glorify the army and this idea of resistance. It looks like media filter of news. This is really easy because a lot of these terrorists are indoctrinated from a really young age, and this is all they know how to believe. The vast majority of these people don't have a legitimate reason to commit acts of terror. They're just an unfortunate product of their situation that we need to fix, not sympathize with. Secondly, terrorism is unacceptable regardless of reason, and that's why there is never going to be a legitimate grievance that can justify their actions. Doing crimes because of legitimate grievances looks like robbing a store because you can't afford food for their family. People benefit from this, and it's the only way they can live on. But terrorism in itself does not benefit anyone. It doesn't right these grievances. It only creates wanton destruction and kills people for the sole reason of creating fear in your enemy. Thirdly, the vast majority of people these terrorists are attacking were not responsible how, for how a decade ago the U.S. invaded the Middle East. The people that these terrorists are slaughtering are women and children. They have absolutely zero grievances against these innocent people. This takes out a massive chunk of the impact about how the press has a responsibility to show the truth because it's anything but. But moving on to our second substantive on how this trivializes the people who died. Many people died in multiple terrorist attacks upon American soil, which inflicted severe post-traumatic stress on these family members and these surviving victims. These people are ones who had their arm blown to bits in an explosion, who have seen their parents bleeding out in their arms, who have watched the towers fall with their kids trapped in them with nothing they could do. People also fought in the war against Islamists, watched their comrades die after being bombed or stabbed to death violently. These are the most vulnerable actors in today's debate. But then, when they see media justifying and logically defending the actions of terrorists that have done atrocities in your very own country against your people, it's extremely traumatizing for them. It throws away years and years of healing and makes these people mad and hurt just for a second time for the things that have happened to their family members. And even worse, now society is starting to condone them, and now it becomes a debate about whether this terrorism was justified. We would say that it's fundamentally unjustified for these people to have their experiences invalidated, to have their trauma shown as something that could have been caught justifiably. Before I move on, I'll take a POI. Three, we never two, 
We yep. never said that we're going to glorify the behavior of these terrorists. What we're saying is that what's going on in the current world with this misinformation, without the big picture that news is like purposefully hiding the actual intentions of these terrorists, we're actually to make people more informed. We're never said we're going to see them in like a more positive light, basically. Jake, I literally responded to this in my framing. I literally said that the only way in which you can have this like kind of um, like have this kind of justification be shown is if you portray them in a light of sympathy. If you don't portray them as something that they did was really wrong and had no legitimate justification for it, then people don't have this opportunity to have sympathy for them and glorify them. We say that this is a fundamental disconnect between intent and reality. Our third substantive is why this increases violence. The cultural of sympathy and acceptance towards these terrorists leads to the normalization of extreme violence as long as there's perceived to be a legitimate reason. Even if you see them as criminals, you're seeing them as tragic heroes and characters who did what they needed to do for the sake of the greater good, even if what they did was bad. This mindset is extremely problematic for three reasons. Firstly, this fuels current supporters of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. At the time of the war on terror, before the media's demonization of terrorists, there were thousands of people, Islamist sympathists, who send money, weapons, and resources to terrorist organizations spread out all over the globe. They make this worse for two reasons. One, there'll be an increase in Islam as terrorist supporters because now these people are being educated on why they actually have justifiable reasons to do what they do. But secondly, for the people who already had sympathetic thoughts towards these terrorists, they're going to be greatly emboldened because before, very understandably, they faced significant criticism, hate speech, disgust from family members and friends for voicing their opinions. But now on the proposition side, the culture shifts so people are desensitized to these people. These supporters can publicly advocate for or show support for others and rally other people to support them. They therefore can use this as a justifiable excuse by using this narrative to say that the people who don't support the extreme Islamists are just heartless and don't know how to empathize with the very legitimate grievances that the terrorists face. But secondly, on their side of the house, any form of violence is going to be romanticized and glorified in their world, even if that's not what their model was intending. All people who commit violence will now empathize with them, thinking they have a justified cause. For example, school shooters, if even terrorism, which in the status quo is really painful to talk about, accepting it, it's unthinkable. If even terrorism becomes acceptable or justified, that is the tipping point for all media to romanticize violence as well, and people who are on the verge of committing violence now do so. These people will also face much less social backlash for their actions. Serial killers will be glorified. Hate crimes will also increase because now people are being taught that they can commit acts of terror and hatred as long as they can perceive a justified reason. And for a lot of these misinformed bigots, a refugee or an immigrant coming in and stealing their job, even if there's no logic behind this, is a justifiable reason for their death. But third and lastly, if the general public is more tolerant to violence, this means juries are too. A lot of people who commit these violent crimes will get lighter sentences. Not only do the people who principally deserve to get punished, get let off scot-free. They even create even more problems because there's going to be a lot less deterrence to committing crimes. And that's why we are so proud to oppose. Chair, you had one job. Okay, I am good to go. Uh, my name is Alex Lee. I'll be giving the second for proposition. Uh, PUIs either visually or in the chat, please. Uh, and if everybody's ready, I can begin. For far too long, media has demonized Islamists as perpetual villains to the enlightened West. For far too long, media has painted them as perpetual enemies to the civilized world. And for far too long, media has villainized them as perpetual barbarians to white society. What should you expect in this speech? Firstly, one crucial note on framing. Secondly, I'm actually gonna introduce my third substance first because I think it engages quite well with their case. Before finally refuting opposition case material and rebuilding our own. One crucial clarification on framing first though, this is really important. What is the significance of portraying Islamists as criminals with legitimate grievances? I think there were two super key implications here. Firstly, and crucially, we treat them as criminals. That is to say, individuals who may be capable of undergoing some level of rehabilitation, individuals who may have been wronged in some way, and individuals who may have been let down a life of crime by uncontrollable factors. Panel, I posit that this is in fact the case for the majority of modern day terrorists. The average terrorist recruit is a teenage male who has witnessed Western nations like the US march into their land, bomb their homes and wage war against their religion and their people. Note, 
This was not the same as glorifying terrorists or somehow justifying the murder of women. I'm so unclear where opposition gets this characterization because nowhere does the motion say that. They largely just assert that you need to portray them in a light of sympathy to somehow propose the motion. I'm not even sure why this is mechanized to be true. Also, by your own logic, if people are rational enough to know that even if just a small portion is committing violence, then that that's not the like, representative of the entire population in general. Presumably, they're smart enough to know that some terrorists are actually just evil. Presumably, they can make that distinction on our side of the house as well. I want to make something really clear, though, here, panel. There's a difference between recognizing that someone may have had a legitimate motivation for doing a bad action, and there's a difference between that and supporting that bad action as being legitimate in the first place. I think on our side of the house, you get increased recognition as to their being the existence and the possibility of legitimate motivations in the first place, so we can get correct for those motivations in the first place, without necessarily needing to condone those actions to begin with. Second key implication, as Jake tells you in first, the counterfactual for opposition is to permanently demonize and villainize those individuals. So if you consider their grievances legitimate, that's the best way we get reform on our side of the house. Because when you understand the root causes of why people do what they do, note that that's different from accepting or justifying the things that they do. Instead of just blindly labeling them as inherently evil, Evil, you can then correct those mistakes and better prevent terrorism in general. Okay, I'm going to introduce my third substantive of increasing terrorism. I think it engages really well with their case. The thesis here is that as a result of demonization of Islamic terrorists, it starts a tit for tat escalation of tensions that leads to increased terrorism. How does this happen? Firstly, note that one of, if not the primary grievances that fuels many terrorist organizations is anti American, anti Western sentiment. They believe that nations like the US, continents like Europe, and in general, white societies of the North have historically infringed on their land, invalidated their religions, and even bombed their homes. That is to say, their primary grievance is how the West views and treats them. Secondly, then, what happens when global media demonizes them, paints them as perpetual villains? You necessarily entrench that narrative in a way that is permanent. You end up stuck in a self-fulfilling prophecy in which tensions are inflamed, motivations are infueled. You're like you lock yourself in an, in, in an irreversible us versus them mentality, which materializes on your side. What are the impacts here? It means firstly, terrorist groups now have infinite supply of fuel. They start a cycle of violence in an attempt to change the minds and actions of a Western order that is unwilling to budge. That means, for instance, you forever ensure their recruitment pools are full. Quite simply, all of this means an increase in terrorist attacks. More importantly, though, for the many organizations that are regional and aren't driven by anti-Western sentiments in the status quo, you incentivize them to go international. You probably incentivize a lot of coalition building, more alliances between terrorist groups at the point at which you position yourself as a clear common enemy. We've even seen this destructive media narrative result in terrorists partnering with countries and regimes who can fund them and legitimize their actions in the first place. Look to Pakistan with the Mujahideen, Saudi Arabia selling arms to Al-Qaeda, or Iran supporting the Houthis in the first place. Okay, I want to move on to actually refuting a lot of opposition case materials. Material here. The first thing I tell you is, ah, majority of individuals are rational enough to know that it's not the entirety of the population when they see a small portion is committing violence. First of all, this should symmetrically apply if it's even true, which means all of your claims about justifying like horrific, like horrible murders in the first place don't actually happen because if people are smart enough to discern the difference, they should also be smart enough to do so on our side of the house. But secondly, this isn't even true. If this is so true, why are those same people perpetuating Islamophobia on a day-to-day -day basis? Why are those same people subscribing to anti-Black hate the second someone cites a few statistics about a small portion of Black populations committing the majority of crime? Sure, people aren't stupid, but they also aren't free of racism and bias. Second thing I tell you is like this weird analogy about Walter White, like he's painted sympathetically or he's morally wrong or something. I think it makes sense that opposition brings up Walter White because they're definitely on something right now. I think this analogy doesn't actually make much sense in the first place at the point at which you recognize that Walter White was still criminally de like depicted as such in the first place. He was still depicted of all the crimes that he did. However, there were legitimate concerns as to whether or not the things he did and the uncontrollable factors that controlled his life dictated his life of crime to begin with. I think that's the point at which you get nuanced analysis of these individuals instead of just a one size fits all uniform, frankly racist, generalizing like characterization of them in the first place. Okay, on their case arguments, they tell you firstly, terrorism is unacceptable. There's no legitimate grievance here. Terrorists are not at all like motivated by legitimate grievances. Really? Because when a little Iraqi boy's home was air bombed back in 2003, or his village was infiltrated and burned down in 1991, both times the US invaded Iraq, it is, is it not legitimate then that he hates America, that he wants to get some level of reparations for the violence that was encroached upon him? Second thing they tell you is that, ah, victims are important, soldiers are important too, and those individuals who fought in the war against terror, we need to like respect them or whatnot. 
One, it's unclear why treating them as criminals isn't enough to fulfill whatever reparations these victims and soldiers need. I personally think it is. I'm not sure where the brink is. I don't know why we need to treat them as terrorists instead of criminals to fulfill that level of like treating and respecting the victim in the first place. I think we get plenty of that on our side of the house. Secondly, it's highly unclear why the majority of these victims require you to paint an entire race of people often, to paint an entire religion in the first place as being necessarily bad. I don't think that's where victims get their closure. I don't think that's what victims even want in the first place. I think victims want the specific individuals who committed those terrorist incidents to be reprimanded, which can still happen under our side of the house. But the nuance is that you're not necessarily painting all of them as being genuinely wrong. You're allowing for general public discourse as to what motivates individuals, whether the actions they did could at all be justified in the first place, if at all explainable. Finally, I want to extend a couple of the things that Jake tells you in first. The first thing he tells you about is this idea of principled obligations. We told you that this is controlled by the white elite and landed gentry in general. The media crucially dictates people's frames and perceptions, as well as their understandings of how the world operates. We told you that demonization gets more clicks and thus more profit for that white wealthy. We told you that the media should never be opining or taking a racist stance on the nature of ethnic individuals in general. The nature and duty of media is to inform, not to incite. That is to say, the duty of the press is to show all sides of that story. I think that duty is violated when you fail to interview any of those people, fail to tell any of their stories, and simply label them as inherently evil. That's the point at which media on their side of the house principally fails to be truthful or representative. That principle operates independent to any consideration of the practical. Why is that true? Because it doesn't actually matter if you buy all of opposition's arguments. It doesn't actually matter if this media integration or narrative is materially good in the first place. The action of having mistruthful or misrepresentative like characterizations in general is in and of itself principally condemnable. Second argument we gave you was on Islamophobia. Crucially, Jake's implication about right-wing populism sees very little engagement. They claim to you, ah, refutation will largely be integrated. It wasn't. After 2001, the US saw some of the highest levels of Republican support in history. Just two years later, the Patriot Act was passed. But it wasn't just the amount of Republican support that increased. We think right-wing politicians were able to use that fear-mongering, that Islamophobia in their campaigns, and coupled with a highly fearful American population due to Western media narratives, right-wing populism was incredible incredibly successful, incredibly detrimental. I think at that point, I'm so proud to propose. DLO, whenever you're ready. Can you guys see and hear me okay? Just PLIs verbally, so please don't put them in the chat, otherwise I won't be able to take them. Look, at the end of the day, government's argument about media becoming more nuanced potentially, right, has no little impact whatsoever comparatively when that comes at the cost of traumatizing those who have been harmed by terrorist attacks because of these reasons government powder to oppose. Then specific rebuttals to what they have told you. First, clarification of what the context is and what it looks like for the narrative of criminals with legitimate grievances looks like. We tell you from the very beginning that they become sources of sympathy and we give you an analogy of Breaking Bad and Walter White, right? The response we hear from this is that at the end of the day, he's still portrayed as a criminal. No, that is an afterthought because the final understanding that people get is that his actions were motivated by his need to for survival. The end you get is like, he's a charismatic character that is lovable. It invokes sympathy and understanding rather than the condemnation of his criminal actions of, for instance, selling cocaine. And there's lack of like, they kind of gloss over the parts of the, like the, him selling cocaine, the, bene the harms that it inflicts on communities, people becoming addicted, causing gang violence, et cetera, et cetera. We tell you that this the, on their side of the house, Wait. there's going to be a glorification of you know, thank you and acceptance of people be, uh, sh people um, showing criminals with, um, by when people show criminals with legitimate grievances. Grievances. DPM asserts that it is different. However, he has given you no specific manifestations of this narrative in society, whereas we have. The implication of portraying them as criminals with legitimate grievances is the following. There's probably going to be glorifications and movies and documentaries that come from the terrorist perspective. 
there's going to be over trauma uh, over dramatization of, of historical mistakes made by the US there's going to re be repetition regarding these things they're going to paint terrorism and as an acceptable action in war some sort of retaliatory justice against American dominance and exploitation exactly the basically the speech that DPM has given you they're probably going to have like hot actors portray Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda members they're going to make them relatable give them a sad beautiful backstory that makes people sympathize with them and like them that is the point in which them being a terrorist them doing terrorist Wait. actions become an afterthought just like Walter White being a criminal becomes an afterthought after this please note that this is analogous to the holocaust Germany for instance was forced to pay for the mistakes of the allied powers in World War One they have been exploited they've been forced to pay large reparations of the Treaty of Versailles which di directly destroyed the German economy many of thousands of people were forced to you know um live in poverty and unable to sustain themselves but look what Hitler did was that he blamed the Jews the people who had nothing to do with such um such suffering he made them the scapegoats this is analogous to terrorists they're extremely angry at the past actions of Americans for instance and specifically what what rich white politicians living in ivory tower society what specific actions American soldiers did and now they're blaming and bombing thousands of innocent individuals daughters um, like babies children out the elderly who had who weren't even alive during the time that these so-called atrocities took place they are the true innocents and therefore this is going to be this, these, this is in itself a demonic action and never legitimate before I move on I'll take a point Panel, Breaking Bad proves to us that not all crimes are black and white. It teaches us the lesson that banning drugs isn't the sufficient solution, rather that we should be helping those poor individuals who have been forced into lives of crime by uncontrollable right, facts. Right, exactly. So the argument is that the media has an obligation to portray truth and there's nuance, right? Look, the argument here is that um, there's two mechanisms underneath this. Firstly, is that the racist white people are in power, which is factually untrue. We live in a diverse, relatively liberal world, and any sort of racist, misogynistic content is directly canceled right now. The second mechanism here that they give you is that all of this like negative inflammatory content is much more popular on TV and popular media, which is also factually untrue because people want to look at like funny comedies or positive things, reality TV shows or things like that, and not just consume a bunch of like documentary and poppy propaganda that is like spreading hate and racism and all of these things. So their argument in itself does not make any sense. How, furthermore, the impact only impacts Muslim terrorists, right? And we, do, we think that to a large extent, that's fine. Any harm incurred is not as significant. Furthermore, Felicity has told you throughout the debate that this is not a legitimate sort of narrative, right? All of these narratives and like people becoming suicide bombers it's all a product of misinformation of twisted narratives of terrorist propaganda al-qaeda indoctrinates child soldiers so that they are going to sacrifice their life these narratives must be called out as illegitimate untrue unfortunate it must be condemned rather than validated furthermore now that we have mentioned that people who are killed by mass bombings are completely innocent and it's a demonic action and terrorism is unacceptable now here's how you weigh this even if we assume on their side that the narrative is more nuanced and correct it does not matter if it detriments victims of terrorist or terrorist attacks which are the most vulnerable actors in this debate we tell you that terrorism is unacceptable regardless of reason and whenever they whenever family members see the debate over whether terrorism is justified or legitimate that's the point in which they get double victim is after losing their own family members, after having seen the Twin Towers collapsing, their, fa their father buried in rubble, they're double victimized because people are arguing that, oh my God, that actor who's uh, acting in that documentary is so charming or whatever, and they're legitimizing all of these actions, which is extremely harmful. Then responding to their sole impact or remaining argument about Islamophobia and how the, it causes us versus them mentalities. Note the extreme Islam Islamophobics who are talking about are racist and irrational. They will take any excuse to be hateful. Terrorism is just a convenient excuse. If it's not terrorism, they'll find something else. They can say that Islam is an inherently violent religion. They can say that historical jihads or raids or murder murders of non-Muslims is reason to hate Muslims. They can hate Muslims because they're simply different. They fast in the month of Ramadan. They have a different language and culture compared to the Western world. They have different clothing. They can scapegoat Muslims for problems that they didn't cause. For instance, right, people who commit mass shootings of Asian Americans aren't rational. It doesn't matter the, what excuse they use. In the same way, Islamophobics, regardless of whether we take away the terrorist portion or not, they're still going to cause the same amount of harms, still say hurtful things, harass and assault Muslims, unfortunately. Then to the average citizens, the majority of people are rational and know that they're that maybe some Islams are criminals, but not all people are terrorists. There's a in popular media, there's a rise of views of the rep, uh, that are representative of the average Muslim. 
For instance, I am Malala is a memorial written by Malala Yosafai talking about Taliban's twisted uh, Taliban twisting the peaceful religion of the Quran. They talk about how people on the ground are suffering from civil war and terrorism. They're talking about its oppressive policies to women, not allowing them to get education. This book has been a bestseller, translated to multiple different languages, integrated into English curriculums within the US and international schools worldwide. This simply means that the majority of people are not ignorant and understand the march that um, the religion of um, Muslims are inherently peaceful and not violent and that not all terrorist people are terrorists. This takes out the majority of the harm that they talk about. Then finally, about them talking about how it legitimizes um, uh, how on, on our side of the house, there's going to be cause of war violence. Note that Felicity has proven to you that we're by increasing um, this sort of popular portrayal, we're going to have a culture of sympathy and acceptance and normalization of extreme violence. We tell you that it's a overtone window. Society gradually but surely will start being des desensitized to even harsh actions like terrorism, bombing thousands for practically no reason, except um, whatever the, Islam, the Muslims think as justified. When this becomes acceptable, when people become desensitized, the smaller actions of violence and aggression becomes legitimized as well. This is increasing. Furthermore, current supporters of ISIS become empowered. There are currently people who send money, weapons, and resources to terrorist organizations spread out through the globe, and these people are now able to publicly support them, and terrorist organizations are able to gain more resources, helping them fuel terrorist attacks. Because of these reasons, never been powder to oppose. Thank you. Thank the speaker, um, GW, whenever you're ready. Awesome. Hi, name Ari Kareem, pronouns he, him, QI preferences verbal. Um, I'm just going to assume that I'm audible. Okay, perfect. I think that the problem with opposition's entire case starts right from their rhetoric. The idea that terrorists are merciless individuals with no justification, no rationale, and no grievance. The Eurocentric perspective that defines opposition's bench ignores the West coups, their military installations, and the constant bombings and warfare that has defined the Middle East for far too long, because that finally changes the proposition. That's why we won this debate. In this speech, a number of things. Firstly, we're going to go over a couple of notes in the macro level of the debate on account of strategy and mischaracterizations. And then we're going to delve into two clashes. Firstly, comparing demonization versus acknowledgement of terrorists as criminals with legitimate grievances. And then secondly, we're going to talk about the principal ground in this debate. Firstly, then, on macro level, there are four things to say here. Number one, opposition attempts to claim that they only demonize terrorists in their world and not Muslims in general. This is just factually untrue because fundamentally, you can't just demonize one subsection of like a religion or like a set of people, right? We think that the way that the media has painted the perception of those terrorists makes it seem as though Muslims in general are all complicit and all think the same way. The idea that they all want to commit the same actions as terrorists, we think that like the fact that there's been blatant mis uh, Islamophobia ever since 9-11 is indicative of the fact that literally Muslims feel as if they're under attack and they feel as though their religion is invalidated in opposition to the world. Secondly, then, I think that their examples and analogies and thought experiments are rather just counterintuitive for their entire bench, right? Not only did, like, Alex just, like, deal with, like, this, like, whole, like, Walter White analogy, right? We also told you that, like, committing crimes out of necessity and stealing from the store is literally, like, counterintuitive to, like, their own case, right? We tell you that right now, because the West's intervention has led to the irreparable harm of thousands of individuals, has led to the destruction of healthcare infrastructure and the way that these individuals live their lives, they have no choice but to commit radical, violent action because that's the only thing that they can do. They're committing a crime out of necessity. And only on our side of the house do we actually acknowledge that to be true. And do we actually acknowledge that, yes, these are crimes, but they also are done out of particular reasons. On their side of the house, you just demonize them and claim that there's no grievance at all. And then I also think just like this new example about like Malala Yousafzai's like, like novel, like I am Malala. I think that she does like a lot of important things. I think something that has just been ignored by opposition is the fact that Malala Yousafzai in that book clarifies that this is a small minority of individuals. The fact that despite that, like despite like the way that the Western media has like like portrayed those individuals, I think that it's still true that Islamophobia is analyzed in that uh, like piece of literature. And I think that like that fact just proves that Islamophobia runs rampant and that you can't just demonize one subsection of a populace. 
What we told you on our side of the house is that you recognize terrorists as criminals. But the difference then is that on our side of the house, you acknowledge terrorists as worthy of having their concerns analyzed by the public lens. You view them as worthy of rehabilitation and you value the fact that the West has structurally and irreversibly damaged the way of life of these individuals. It's remarkably straw manny of opposition to claim that we're sympathizing with terrorists and becoming apologists. In no world are we saying that like violence like in and of itself is good, but you have to remember that these instances of violence are not the same as any other instance of violence as you would see in any other debate. You have to understand that the reason as to why exactly these like terrorists are committing these actions is because they've been historically wrong. And it's also just worth noting that like the fact that you under like there is a lack of analysis of the fact that they are legitimate grievances, which we'll delve into in the speech. Fourth and final note on the macro level is like this like strange like claim that like, oh, people are liberal. So now like all racist and sexist content is being canceled out. This is just factually untrue. Like we already told you that right wingism has only been like running rampant, it has only increased since 9-11, and has only increased when Western media per, like portrays these like individuals as like bad. We think that the fear-mongering and the scare tactics that Western media has in fact implemented is just harmful writ large. First clash then. Demonization versus acknowledgement of terrorists as criminals with legitimate grievances. Their first argument was that like there's like no grievances or legitimate reasons for terrorism. I think that there are two things to say here. That number one, this is reflective of opposition's inability to understand and look at an issue from another perspective. When the CIA installed the Reza Shah Pahlavi in Iran, people saw their religion being desecrated in the name of secularism, in the name of just like ushering in like an era of social progress that many individuals in Iran saw was antithetical to their culture. I think that when you adopt their stance here that terrorists have zero legitimate reasons to actually commit terrorism, you validate the, like the perspectives of right wingers. You validate the perspective that they're just committing like crimes mercilessly and that they are not deserving of any like analysis into their problems. We gave you two arguments under here. Firstly, on our second substantive on Islamophobia, the fact that you increase anti-American sentiment in Muslim majority countries when the media hates their entire religion as just morally corrupt and like harmful. Secondly, you generalize all Muslim people as evil. Thirdly, you see, you would like see like inflammatory rhetoric in the media leading to anger and hatred towards individuals you perceive as threats which supersede all other emotions. And fourthly, you eliminate any potential discourse or valuable conversation that would otherwise change the way that people perceive Islam. It is just remarkably and like fundamentally unclear what they do on their side to actually reduce terrorism, right? We already told you this worth noting on our side of the house, you still recognize those terrorists as criminals, but you now understanding about what they're concerned about, what exactly necessitates this radical action in the first place. And I think the fact that they just ignored our third piece of pause material on demonization increasing terrorism is just where they lost this debate immediately. The fact that Muslim people perceive Western interventionism and Western like like sort of bastardization of their identity through media is as like a threat to like the way of life. We think that that gives them like a historical justification to like actually be able to like take like this radical action. And we also think that when your identity is besmirched and attacked by Western media, it's justified to protect yourself through whatever means possible. This is not a justification for terrorism, but the radical action that feels as though it's the only thing you could do in your possession. I think the lack of engagement with this argument automatically necessitates opposition's loss in this debate because we prove to you that demonization just increases terrorism. When you're in a more desolate position and when you're forced to like like take up arms and we're forced to like fundamentally like keep away for yourself to survive. Second clash on principled ground. Before I continue, are there any QIs? Three, two, one. Moving on. Islamophobia. Oh. oh, yeah, sure. Go on. Given that Islamophobia has existed even prior to 9-11 and so-called demonization of Islam, how is this um argument unique to this debate? Um, because like Islamophobia and like the level of Islamophobia is not static, right? You have to understand that like these feelings of hatred and prejudice towards Muslim people increased when you see like Western media actually like besmirching the identity of Muslim people. When you see this fear mongering and when you see the rich white men perpetuating Eurocentric narratives and the principal ground in this debate that we're about to delve into is about to deal with that POI. There is little to no actual engagement with the proposition on the principled plane in this debate. What we told you here was that there is a clear principle on the obligation of the press, that Western media, primarily controlled by rich white men perpetuating Eurocentric narratives, is extremely harmful at the point at which they have the power to control the public's perception of Islam and Muslim people. We also told you that there are profit incentives to demonize them. I don't think it's true that like everyone wants to just like read like happy-go-lucky like human interest stories all the time. We think that like the fact that you use like these like shock factors and you like you have like negative press is going to like generate more clicks and views. 
Second mechanization we told you under this argument is that you paint like this authors with that mentality. The fact that people generalize Muslim people and belittle them all as terrorists. And we also show you that the media uses scare tactics and paint Muslim people as evil. The final thing that we told you under this argument was that the media should never take objectionable opinionated stance and frame Muslims as evil. Let's face it. The fact is Islamophobia increased after 9-11. Islamophobia increased after Western media just fundamentally like tore up like the way that these Muslims live their lives in the Middle East. You exclude the most important information and never enable the public to consider why it is that terrorism runs rampant in the region, why individuals in the Middle East detest the West. We finally changed that. That's what we we're proud to propose. I'll put whenever you're ready. Um, am I audible? Okay, cool. POIs in the chat, please. Um, I'll take one in round five. Okay, so if everyone's ready, my time will start in three, two, one, go. Panel, I feel like the massive problem on the prop case is that the word terrorism just comes out of nowhere, little in their speech, and th there's a reason for this. It's because they prove that it is some people that have justifications to advocate for change because they've been oppressed by the West in the past. Yes, these people who have justifications try to enact change in some ways, they're regular Muslim people on the ground. These are not people who enact change by slaughtering women and children who have nothing to do with their own oppression. That's why I'm very proud to oppose. So three questions and clash themes in this debate. The first question being, how does it portray a correct narrative to society? The main defense that opposition brings in this entire case essentially is that terrorists aren't glorified in their world. The justification for this is that, ah, our model doesn't glorify terrorists. Yes, we agree that their model doesn't glorify them. This literally ignores all of the new analysis that Felicity and Erica brings out in second and first. When you try to portray another person's point of view in the first place, you're trying to, you're going to necessarily have to have a lot more people sympathizing for them and also people thinking this is a cool thing to do simply because they're witnessing their perspective. These people will be seeing terrorism as an act of vengeance, even if it was a bad thing, it can be seen as a bad thing that was necessary for the greater good to pursue justice. They severely undercover our case, and since this is our only response, you're flowing our case clean, uh, clean enough. We proved these, you these things, right? Their first argument here is essentially that, ah, there's an obligation of the press to, like, portray things in two, uh, in two ways, and also for people to understand the whole situation, and they're the most influential across the world, right? They also talk about how the news should inform instead of villainizing these people, and people are generalized because, like, uh, in their perspectives, right? So we can win right now because realize the clear distinction that Erica gives you in her speech. People can be educated and people in the Middle East have suffered bad things. The things like, like people who are empirically not terrorists, sharing their point of view and sharing how the West has wronged them, we're telling you that terrorists specifically should be absolutely villainized in any scenario possible. But second, we would say that truth is a matter of perspective. Our perspective is that after a woman and children have been slaughtered, they actually are villains, villains, right? Since this is literally Western media, we have fiat to say that we should consider from the viewpoint of the people in the US or the Western society. So that proposition simply doesn't think for the people that have suffered through these events and people that generally watch these media and people that have like actually been in the 9-11 events or seen their uh, their like family die in these buildings, right? But, sec uh, but finally, we don't have the fiat to cater to the people in the Middle East that much and let people see how justified it is for them to commit these atrocities, such as driving the airplane into the twin towers, what we have to do is demonize terrorism in general. And from the most effective way, from the also from like first speech, we already told you through white people like doing the Christchurch shootings and whatnot, right? But then they claim that, ah, we don't look at the aspect of how, like of what the Western did to the Islams, but we need to look at the big picture. In Western liberal democracies, I don't see why need, we need to be showing people these things when it's something that has harmed their country so much. It's extremely immoral for people to see these individuals that just ran into their own country, driving airplanes, their family members to be defended against and seeing terrorists justify their sacrificing for their country. When we're countering terrorism, essentially what they propose is highly ineffective because you keep on, keep on glorifying and sensationalizing them to some extent and justifying the reasons and also like lobbying people into supporting them into doing these actions, right? So therefore, if you weigh against the fact that, uh, that like Alex tries to bring up, we would say that there's actually more support on our side because even people in Western liberal democracies think that these things are cool, right? So therefore, they're going to like give them like um, other types of support, either financial or weapons and stuff like that. 
Scott. But principally, we would say that the principle of lies always outweighs any duty of the media to report to the public. Why is this the case, right? Lies are a prerequisite to anything else when you're fundamentally supporting terrorists and giving them thousands of dollars and people are literally dying on the floor. They're not going to take solstice in the fact that media is accurately reporting the other side of the situation. The second question here is which side benefits the victims more? Their second argument is that there's like this Islamophobia thing, right? There's a few things here. They point out the supposed contradiction in our case says that if people are able to discern normal people from terrorists, we should be able to discern acts of violence to terrorism. This completely ignores the nuance of the mechanization that Felicity gives you in the first speech. Note that we're, no, like nowhere in our mechanism do we say that we're equating terrorism in all forms of violence. We're seeing the fact that showing one form of violence, specifically the most terrifying and horrific, horrific form as something that is illeg like legitimate grievances behind it, something that can be justified, fundamentally changes people's mindsets towards violence and terrorism as a whole. But why doesn't this apply to people, right? People are just very good at recognizing things to surrounding the distinction between like others. People don't believe that just because Hitler committed bad things and deserved to be seen as a demon, that all Germans deserve to be seen as demons, right? This is because individuals are distinctly different people and act as such, and we have all our own mindset and agencies. It's really hard to make that kind of distinction with an action of violence and nebulous concept. And that's where we win this clash. Why? Because this proves to you the only people we're going to be seeing, all Muslim people as terrorists, are people who are fundamentally bigoted to begin with. This There's very little data of the people who were figured it to begin and wanted to find reasons to scapegoat Muslims and get mad at them have just a tiny bit more reason to hate them, right? But also, the problem here is that Islamophobia is punishable by current metrics. We can punish people for hate crimes. We can punish people for other things. You're leaving these people with no alternative when you're forcing them to relieve their most traumatic memories over and over again, right? But then, like we told you, that victims like that have been hurt before, they're actually viewing this sort of Western media. It also traumatizes and inflicts fear amongst the public, especially in Western nations that have experienced this sort of terrorism, where their family members have been actually harmed in these places. For example, in 9-11 survivors, or their family, but now the media is advocating for people to actually think in their perspective and think right. for them. Right? This, they severely undercover this argument because they tell you that terrorists being seen as criminals is enough. No, this is actually not enough because it's not enough when you literally speak, see people around you watching films of the perspective of the people and nodding their head and going, wow, this is actually understandable. The West is quite bad, right? So when you drag up this torture, it's actually going to be extremely traumatizing. But on the weighing here, on their side, you're trudging up years of torture and resentment, forcing people to relieve their worst fears over and over again, wherever they see someone watching a film empathizing with terrorists. These people are most vulnerable because they have no choice at all. They're being showed this narrative, shoved this narrative in their face. They can't tell any authorities because no tangible harm has been done, but the Islams can report hate crimes. They can escape somewhere safe. They can be protected by the authorities, right? This is just fundamentally bad. But the final question then is which side is more terror? The substantive coming up for some second prop is false, right? They're going to start a tit for tat escalation, which leads to more terrorism. A, there's finite ways to indoctrinate someone to join your terrorist organization, and it doesn't really matter if we just give them one more tool in the toolbox. But second, hey, these terrorists are going to be angry anyway. If propositions characterization about how being criminals is already portraying them as bad people, it takes down their entire case because like, it, it means that there's terrorists going to still be angry about being seen as bad people. In second propositions words, words, there's no brink because these terrorists are not going to care about whether you like sold their told their story or not. But third, the point of the root cause of the attack of the homeland can be extremely aggressive anyways. I don't see any delta of these terrorists are just going to go from being violent to have be more violent in the, uh, in the, at the very end of the day. So this substantive is severely unmechanized and therefore we shouldn't be flowing it. So what do we tell you at the end of the day? We told you there's going to be hundreds and thousands of new supporters of terrorists after they've all seen their stories. They're going to be sending they're, they're going to be sending weapons, equipment, and money to be able to support these organizations, letting them branch out and recruit even more members, essentially what Alex tells you in second. I told you that people who support terrorists can be involved in and even recruit people in the West to perpetuate these issues. You're comparing on their side, these terrorists were already angry, sl getting slightly more angry at the very end, or, or to the fact that these terrorist groups who were already angry to begin with, with increasing amount of supplies over and over again, and the money over and over again, they get a hundred times, right? We would say that there's going to be angry terrorists on either side of the house. We would rather live than, like, we would rather live in a world in which there's no supplies instead of people continuously funding them, continuously giving them uh, supplies, and for all these reasons, we're very proud to oppose. Reply whatever you're ready.
opposition must lose today's debate because they have made four crucial mistakes. Firstly, they take an incredibly soft stance. They say, still say that they're going to condemn violence, that they're going to condemn terrorists, but the state, at the same time, they contradictorily say that they deserve sympathy, that they deserve to be, to be forgive, forgiven to a large extent, and they are capable of being rehabilitated. Note that this rhetoric does not apply to, for instance, um, like Hitler's like legionnaires or whatever, the people who have forced uh, forced uh, Jews into ga gas chambers, because these views are uh, these actions in itself are ultimately illegitimate, and that re regardless of whatever circumstantial reasons that may have caused such ideals, it is still at the end of the day unacceptable and morally abhorrent. Therefore, we tell you that on their side of the house, acceptance of such values in itself is principally unjustified. And furthermore, on their side, there's going to be a glorification of such people, as Brian has told you throughout his debate, uh, throughout his speech, and also Felicity and I in the first and second. The second mistake they make is that all of their impacts are non-comparative. Let's take a look at their first impact of Islamophobia. Note that extreme people, unfortunately, will always be um, always be racist or uh, and are always irrational. They have constant excuses to scapegoat these individuals. However, the average person, as we have proven, are aware that not all um, Muslims are Osama bin Laden. There's popular culture, but when we have proven that there's like novels, like I am Malala, everyone don't look at Muslims and automatically point at them and say that they're terrorists. Ryan gives you the debate winning response, telling, telling you that just because Hitler has caused genocide of Jews doesn't mean that people believe that all Germans are like Hitler. Look, the second, but, uh, second impact that they give you and the harm that they give you is that there's going to be anti-Western sentiment. This is also not unique to this debate. The US has done pretty crappy things in the past. They have colonized countries. They have exploited them for their oil. All of these reasons and all of these political like you know, contradictions and clashes mean that there's going to be constant you know, hate of Middle Eastern people against the US. Therefore, the idea that Western media suddenly changing their view on terrorism changes the international politics between Middle Eastern countries and the US is extremely unrealistic and their impact does not have any hope. That what is the third uh, third mistake that they made? They have said that they are now traumatizing and double victimizing victims of terrorist, um, terrorism, and they have given you no, res uh, no response to our argument and principle. Terrorists are people who slaughter innocent civilians for the sole purpose of spreading fear, and young children have their limbs blown off in explosions. Women are slaughtered and violated. Doctors and teachers and people like you and me are brutally tortured and killed just for terrorists to, quote unquote, spread a message. Know that the people we're talking about here are those who have experienced in such traumatic events. They're the ones who are truly innocent and vulnerable. Weigh this against their sole impact of the principle of new ones portrayal of terrorists. We've already proven that Islamophobia doesn't affect the wide majority of Muslims, that the only actors that remains affected are like terrorists. And honestly, at the end of the day, on a comparative level, we think that an accurate portrayal of them is not as important as making sure that these victims are not double traumatized, just as they have done in the past. Then, Finally, they also fail to acknowledge our argument on increasing violence. We tell you there's going to be a shift of an overtime window of what is viewed as socially acceptable. Violence becomes legitimized. People become sympathetic, specifically due to the glorification and acceptance. Now, we tell you that on, on, on our impact, if one person who is currently contemplating school shootings see a sympathetic portrayal of, for instance, terrorism, they view that people are no longer going to counsel them as much or criticize them as much for contemplating violent things, for doing violent things, and they actually commit those things that we think that we take this debate there's no response and government consistently just pushes the principle they fail to realize that on our side of the house there's also people supporters of isis who live throughout the country these people are now funding terrorism more giving them more money causing more suicide bombings causing widespread suffering and destruction we uh, we win them based on magnitude and severity for, uh, finally, the government's only line of defense is a principle about a new one's portrayal of Western media. And at the end of the day, they cannot win this debate based on that fragile principle. Please place your ballot for all positions. Thank you. I thank the speaker. Um, Jake, whenever you're ready. Yep, I'm good. <laughs> all right. Assuming no one's not ready, I'm just going to get started. Perfect. Panel, I think opposition all muted their computers the moment I finished my intro. Because somehow, every single one of the responses purely mishandles our case, sees it as something it isn't, and just ignores and doesn't address any of the real argumentation we've given you today. Look past the straw ends of side opposition and see what we're really arguing for. We're so proud to propose. I'll do two things in this speech. 
Firstly, I'm going to clarify what our site actually looks like, given that the opposition has made an effort to make our world as confusing and misleading as possible. Secondly, I'm going to provide for you two clear paths to ballot for a side proposition. Firstly, on the principle, and then finally, on the practical. Firstly, though, let's just clarify what our side actually looks like, because side op opposition has made a clear effort to confuse you. Panel, we're not justifying any of the actions of terrorists. Read the motion. We treat them as criminals, not inherently evil terrorists. That's the difference. They try to give us all this FIA analysis, but panel, they're just trying to turn this into an entirely different debate. Don't let them force us to defend an entirely different burden. They try to mischaracterize our side as painting these individuals with sympathy in the media. But panel, there's a difference between considering the motivations that drive terrorists to do horrible things and actually justifying those horrible actions in and of themselves. They themselves told you, people are smart enough to not be racist, so they recognize that even if some small minority of a group commits crimes, not everyone in that group are criminals. Even if that's true, though, those same individuals are still obviously smart enough on our side of the house to discern the difference. We're actually still better here because it's probably easier to recognize that terrorist actions are like inhumane than it is to free yourself of all racism and bias that they ask you to. Panel, truthfully, there's a difference here between a grievance and a reason. We can't recognize that these reasons, like the individuals, have been like wronged in some way without recognizing that these wrongs were legitimate reasons. Don't let them get any of their offense off of glorification because that's clearly not what's happening under our side of the house. This straw man alone loses opposition in this debate, given that none of the responses have actually engaged with the substance of this debate. They're abusive at best and detrimental at worst. Now then, onto our two paths to ballot in today's debate, first on the principle and then on the practical. Firstly, on the principle, what did we give you on this? We gave you our first substantive argument that's solely on the principle. We told you it's morally wrong for the media to do what they do in the status quo, quo which deliberately provides an incomplete picture of Islamic terrorism in order to inflame the public. What did they largely tell you on this? Their primary response was just a straw man. Don't let them get away with this piece. They just say, oh, we're literally just glorifying the terrorism. They brought up this random point in the DLO, which is like, or D the DPM, which is like, or yeah. We're just gonna make like a documentary, right? We never mentioned this happening once. News anchors aren't gonna be like, oh yeah, I feel so bad for these terrorists. The entire point of the media is to inform. The principal argument was not that we should be defending these actions. It's that they need to be reporting the real picture instead of trying to hide things. Now, on the practical past of the ballot, I think there's three reasons you vote for us here. Firstly, on Islamophobia, again, this was barely responded to. They gave you two random responses that just threw out. Firstly, they give responses just like, everyone's a liberal, so people are just gonna cancel. This literally just does not materialize. This analogy that they gave us about Hitler just isn't responses to our logic. I think it's pretty indicative when they answer our argument about racism and Islamophobia with an example about how people weren't racist to German after Hitler, Germans, who, of course, are literally white. Secondly, they give you this response where it's just like, oh yeah, let's just report hate crimes. That's after they happen in the first place. And there's still no way to solve for bias and Islamophobia if it doesn't turn into a hate crime. Secondly, though, we gave you this point about the right-wing surge. Still, basically unresponded to, we told you that there's a right-wing surge which links to political impacts and impacts of Islamophobia. But thirdly and most importantly, though, our most important passive ballot in this debate is about this increase in terrorism, which goes criminally unresponded to. The DLO totally drops this, and the first response comes out in the op three, far too late. Why does this point alone win us the debate? On their side of the house, terrorism increases because we antagonize terrorists more. That's much more of an incentive. That compounds every single one of their impacts about terrorism, takes out all of their offense and cleaning with this debate. So proud to propose. Thank you guys for such a wonderful debate. Um, are we disclosing here or saving the for awards or something? Okay. Yo, hand me, get on here. Hand me, what are we doing? Yo, that's crazy for real. Dude, no one wants to answer Rodrigo, bro. A tab just ghosted. All right, how I... about we just we do it like normal and write our RFDs? Um, because why uh, not? Yeah. Can I'll write the RFDs right now? Uh, I'll ask Cammy right now on Discord. Okay, bet.
Apparently, Ham did not hear anything we said. <laughs> Can he hear us now? Ham is apparently in class right now. Oh my goodness! Just, just Bro. usurp power. Just, just take over, Will. Just, you yeah, decide. Will but... let us announce it here. Oh uh, yeah, you. I will usurp your power if the after you all have submitted your RFDs. W.
Just checking. Was Hanming is Hanming one of the judges? No, Hanming is no. Tab. All right, all right. All right, we came to a decision, y'all. Are both teams here? Yep. Um, opposition, are you here? We're here. Amazing. So, um, the panel came to a split decision. Um, it was a 4-1 decision for uh, the side proposition um, the Team Orion. Um, congratulations. Um, would the judge that voted for the opposition like to go first? Perhaps. You don't have to. You don't want Okay, we'll, we'll go first. A bad day for me, I guess. All right. Um, so does anyone want to start? Anybody that voted for opposition? Um, anybody else on the panel? I can I can go first. It doesn't matter. Oh, uh, I guess I'll go. All right. Thanks. All right, let me pull up the arm. <laughs> okay. Um, call me Saul the way I'm going to call this round for side proposition. Um, very well done by both teams. Uh, within this round, I think that the ballot fundamentally comes down to is whether or not treating these people as criminals with legit grievances is a good idea. I think it fundamentally is with like all the arcs that were here. Um, Jake and Alex did some work that was really fire on how demonizing Islamic terrorists leads to significant Islamophobia. Uh, Arik backed that up, which isn't morally right. And additionally, how this like structure of demonization creates a structural issue issues. That result in terrorism. So if I like try to universalize that, we can see that in like the prop world, um, ter terrorism and Islamophobia would be like minimized in comparison to the op world, where I see us like continuing our status quo, which includes bombing the Middle East and making kids in the region join terrorist starter cells because they were alienated by Western media. Um, at that point, it's a pretty easy prop ballot. But then some generic problems I had with the debate um, was that I felt like the opposition strawmanned a lot. Um, and the rhetoric was low key kind of problematic, but it was resolved. So, like, yeah, um, breaking bad reference, really. Other than that, fire round, have fun, and email me if you need. 
All right, I'll just build off that then. Um, basically, everything he said. Uh, let's see. I had like, so the media thing, like, I wasn't really, no, no, not the media thing, sorry. The, um, I'm looking on the opposition side. The whole argument about, in my opinion, like, you guys, like, your strongest argument was the last one about how, like, innocent people get victimized. So I agree with, like, Rishit. Instead of focusing on a Breaking Bad reference, you guys could have just focused on, like, these innocent people who've already been hurt. Like, you said some of that, but, like, you, it wasn't extended and it wasn't weighed. I feel like that could have been more powerful than maybe, um, as you said, like, the already present Islamophobia being increased. Maybe, like, the re um, the double harm of, like, victims is more important. So I think you guys missed on that. And then the proposition responded really well to your other arguments, which I think you kind of collapsed on towards the end. So I think that part was a little messy, uh, the proposition, I mean, the opposition side. Um, so a big part of it was also like me just voting kind of lay because the proposition gave me a very clear ballot. So I didn't have to think too much about it, but I did, I did look at the ballot just to make sure. And the, I mean, my flow to make sure and the flow also looked like very proposition sided, if that would make sense. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what the other judges said. Just one thing, a lot of the things introduced in Opposition 3 should have been introduced earlier. I feel like there were quite a few like strong points in Opposition 3. Is get like earlier people to say it. And yeah, generally, yeah, Proposition 1. Um, yeah, I voted prop as well. And um, honestly, I thought that by the 01, uh, prop was going to lose this debate because I think proposition introduced a rather weak case. Like, I think you guys could have like played up the arguments a lot, like a lot. Um, and I'm not going to lie, before I came into this round, I really thought opposition had no path to ballot. And I was like, what are we doing debating this? But uh, like at, after I heard the first speech, I kind of understood what, uh, what the intuition is on the opposition. Anyway. Um, yeah, the reason I vote prop is because I think opposition was mostly unengaging and the debate starts happening in the back half, probably because of opposition. Uh, the biggest problem I had, like just with the rounds was framing, like bruh, characterized media, like nobody characterized media. And I know for, I don't know if y'all cut this, I'm pretty sure y'all cut this, but like proposition characterized implicitly media as the news while opposition thought it was Hollywood. And I'll, nobody ever addressed it and I was like bro what the heck but also opposition like that's like a, I guess it's like a fair like interpretation to encompass Hollywood as media but if you're going to do that you should also like make it strategic right because then you could have had like links about how like Hollywood has like an incentive level to uh uh dramatize uh terrorism which inherently includes like making like sympathy arcs and stuff like that right I don't know um but I, I think that would have been a link to your sympathy but we never got that anyway here are the op arguments that I bought um there's Four in particular. Uh, one, I buy that the slaughter of innocent civilians is objectively bad, and that terrorism, no matter uh, how bad the grievances may be, is uh, is like uh, is wrong because the vengeance is misplaced onto innocent people. Two, I buy that the media portrayal of them as criminals with legitimate grievances draws in sympathy generally because people are more likely to justify their actions, even if the media is not actually justifying them inherently. Uh, three, I buy that it's disrespectful to victims and traumatizes them, the double victim argument. And four, I buy the Overton window shift argument. Um, I just think that it was terminalized way too late because it was like in the three and the four. Um, a lot of this was poorly extended until the back half of the debate. And I think the Overton window shift argument was maybe the most strategic argument in the round, and it just didn't get terminalized. Um, prop arguments that I bought, uh, four, uh, one is the media obligation principle, although I don't think it's very like meaningful, uh, two is the Islamophobia argument about how it's like very nearly in, uh, inseparable from the demonization of terrorism, uh, not because of media, but because of bigoted individuals. Uh, I get some like pushback about how it's non-unique because Islamophobia existed before 9-11 and stuff, but like the scalar analysis that Arik explained, like there's like levels to it, uh, made sense to me. And I think it's just undeniable that that's true. Um, I also buy Jake's uh, reply analysis that it is more probable that people can agree that terrorists are bad because they're criminals than it is for them to agree that not all Muslims are bad people, right? Like people are just forever going to be bigoted. Um, 
third argument I buy is to have right-wing populism. I thought this argument was untouched and it was one of the most strategic in the round. Um, I would have liked to see it terminalized a little bit more. Like I think opposition or proposition does not spike it as hard as they could considering it was literally untouched. Um, the impacts to like, like co-opting all of the harms of the conservative party uh, was really smart, um, but yeah. Fourth argument was the increase in terrorism um, because of anti-Western sentiment argument. I thought it was smart. Um, it wasn't really responded to until the back half of the debate, which I thought it was a little bit too far into the debate for me to consider the responses. Uh, the internal clash wasn't enough either. Um, and like what Drake said in the reply is true. Like this argument, if bought by any of the judges, wipes all of Ops offense. Because if terrorism increases because demonization angers like terrorists uh, more, uh, then it becomes like a positive feedback loop of like the us versus them mentality in which like the West hates terrorists, the terrorists hate us, and now we hate them more, right? And so like uh, that co-ops all of the impacts on opposition about like victims and terrorism being objectively an evil action, right? Um, so I thought that because I bought that, there's like no spot on the floor that I could vote opposition. Uh, here are some things that I think both sides crucially missed. Um, and I think it would have made for a lot better debate if any of these arguments were mentioned. Um, I think that, op well, like just generally, like Op didn't extend to the really good arguments. So, like the hate crime justification argument about like school shootings and stuff didn't get like actual terminalization until the reply speech and the, uh, the three. Um, and the juries and like lighter penalties argument was really, really intelligent. This is a lot of the Overton analysis, but like think about it. Like if juries give lighter sentences because they are trained to sympathize with criminals now and find rationale behind their crimes, then um, like I, it's like, they're like mutually reinforcing points because now people will be more likely to commit crimes that they can find rationale for, uh, even if the rationale is misplaced. Um, and because they know that they're going to get lighter sentences. I thought it was a smart arc. It wasn't really extended. Um, two, I think that proposition or opposition never replies to the media principle, but you could have easily just said that just because the media is ob like objective in this one area of reporting terrorism, uh, it doesn't mean they're going to be objective on anything else. And therefore, if they're like, and also like, Props characterization is that inflammatory coverage brings in more money because that's what people like to see, right? And so if that's true, if all of a sudden media corporations have to report objectively, then they're going to lose on revenue. And if they lose revenue, then they're just going to use more inflammatory reporting on every other like aspect of reporting, which means like social movements get more inflammatory uh, uh, reporting, other foreign affairs get more inflammatory report, uh, reporting. And that uh, within of itself violates uh, Proposition's own principle because now nobody's uh, getting objective coverage. And also um, it worsens like a lot of the uh, terms that they talk about. Um, the third thing that I think could have been said, this is Proposition's argument. Um, I, I don't know why Proposition never impacted out to Western accountability. Like if people are more aware of why terrorists are like have uh, legitimate grievances and what those grievances are, they're going to be more aware of the uh, atrocities committed by the West and why these wars are so insufferably useless. And then they're more likely to like hold uh, policymakers accountable and hold like foreign affair advisors accountable for instituting shit policies and putting an end to endless wars, right? Uh, I also think that that could have served as a link to the um, terrorism increasing argument because like if you have more conservative uh, ideology, like uh, being like pervasive in the US, you have more support for endless wars. If you have more endless wars, you have more anti-Western sentiment. It's a positive feedback loop. Um, I think that was actually the fourth thing too. Um, but the fifth thing uh, for opposition, uh, op you could have, I was really like hoping that you were the team that makes the uh, right wing populism argument. Cause you could have just said like the right wing, like the right wing just like in general, fucking hates whenever media disagrees with them and just like reports the opposite of their ideology. And so if all of a sudden the media is like, hey, these terrorists do suck, but like we should hear them out a little bit. Like conservatives would be kind of pissed and they'll just reject media as a whole because they believe that it's, you know how like they're like conspiracy theorists and shit, right? Like they believe that the establishment is like, I don't know, deep state and stuff. Um, and so because of that, um, the right wing will just reject the media and become even like, more turned off by like facts, studies, empirics, and media uh, reporting. And so that entrenches all like shitty conservative takes by like a thousand percent, right? Because now they are uh, less like uh, founded on facts and what's truth and whatever. And I think that could have like been a really good flip of the conservative argument they made. Anyway, that's all I have. Uh, yeah, Rob wins.